What's going on, fellas? I had a video that I'm pretty keen to make because I think that I will be able to, uh, to pass on some maybe helpful knowledge or at least a framework for thinking about building your own program um, that I think might help some of you out. So we're gonna, I'm, what we're talking about today is micro workouts, which is just a random uh, term I'm gonna use to describe uh, the general framework of structuring a workout that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but first, we're going to kind of start with a story as to how this came about. So when I was relatively new to lifting and I had just completed my first powerlifting meet, I was training at a YMCA, as I did for the next couple of years. Um, and I went to see if there were any powerlifting gyms in Seattle. Um, powerlifting had grown a reasonable amount around this time when I was getting into it, but due to the very high costs of being in Seattle, there were no power, like, true powerlifting gyms within Seattle proper for the most part. Um, so I was looking around and I found a website that I'm not sure if they still are around, but Powerlifting Watch used to have a gym finder where you could type in where you are and uh, different gyms could basically apply to be on there just to like say, hey, uh, we're a powerlifting friendly gym, not necessarily a powerlifting gym, but a, a gym where powerlifting the activity is not frowned upon. Um, and I remember seeing uh, Bull Stewart's gym and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm all right. I like the YMCA. Uh, and then towards the end of my senior year of high school, we were asked to do a internship, find some local business that would let us uh, just kind of hang out there every day. Uh, and then we would come back and present on what we did. And through a connection at the school, I actually ended up uh, interning at Bull Stewart's gym. Uh, Bull Stewart was actually a multiple time world champion back when the AAU and the IPF were kind of the same thing. There was this big drug tested powerlifting organization. Uh, Bull Stewart was a multiple time world champion in the 275 pound weight class. Uh, absolute genetic freak, even at 60 when I was working for him, didn't lift anymore, just diesel as hell. Very, very strong. Uh, you know, and I was enamored with what was going on around me. I was like, oh, this is great. I found someone who's much, much better at this hobby than I am. Um, and so I immediately, you know, I've read everything I could find on the internet because I've always been very passionate about strength training. Um, and I kind of was like, okay, I've got daily undulating. I've got all, I've got all this on lock. I've been researching like a madman, listening to podcasts on the bus on my way to the gym every single day. I feel like I know a reasonable amount. So I started picking Bull's brain. And the way he talked about training was so foreign to what I had learned. Uh, and largely it was much more simplistic, right? We're talking about a lifter who was competitive in the 80s uh, before most of the methodology that we've established uh, nowadays was really well known at all. Uh, and it was, it was a very different framework of thinking about preparing for competition, and I found it very interesting. And, uh, on a tangentially, Nick Best, the World's Strongest Man, uh, the world's strongest man uh, competitor who started out in powerlifting, actually cites uh, Bull Stewart alongside Ed Cohen and some other guys as the one who taught him how to train, which, funnily enough, uh, watching Nick Best's videos, the way he talks about training very much reminds me how Bull talked about training. And the way they talk about it is, this is a good workout. They didn't talk about exercise selection or frequency or you know what progression scheme we're going to use. They're just like, this is a good combination of exercises in this order for these rep ranges. I found it highly effective for myself. You should try it. Uh, much the same, this is how Ronnie Coleman learned to lift. Right When he went to Metroflex originally, uh, he was given a free gym membership in exchange for uh, competing and basically doing the routine that he was given. And he was just given a set split with set workouts and they didn't change for the better part of 15 years across uh, Ronnie Coleman's wildly successful competitive career. So obviously we can't just do as Ronnie Coleman did and expect the same results. That's not what I'm saying, but I do like this old school framework. Obviously I put a tremendous amount of thought into training as I think it's what's very interesting, but I also think there's genius and simplicity. And I like pass like the idea that you could just say like, Hey, this exact workout, my back used to be small and weak. I got this routine from a guy with a big, strong back. I started doing this routine verbatim. I got good results. Maybe you should try it. I like the simplicity in that. Is it really the, is it the pinnacle of program design? Absolutely not. And it's probably best, the best way to train for powerlifting with the amount of individual variants that we're looking at. Probably not. But I can't help but like that structure. 
just because it's such a simple framework that's easy to get buy-in from people on, and it, it does drive results. Maybe they're not 100% optimal, but passing on a decent workout, that person will also get decent results from the workout. You guys will hear me talk a lot about how there is no real optimal. Optimal is probably there's a variety of paths that lead to about the same competitive outcome. So you can kind of pick the preferential one, much the same, we have a lot of creativity in creating a workout. So the fact that it's cookie cutter doesn't always necessarily mean that it's bad, especially from a hypertrophy perspective. So how can we look at this from the framework of us, guys who are trying to get stronger, right? We're building our program, and the first thing we're gonna look at in a training week, which is probably the length of your microcycle, is how often should I be doing each lift? And uh, I get asked this a lot. I would recommend probably three pressing sessions, two squatting sessions, and one deadlifting session. If you're a little bit longer limbed, maybe that looks like one and a half squatting sessions where one back squat, one front squat, uh, maybe that might look like one and a half deadlifting sessions, one deadlift, one RDL. If you handle deadlift volume really well, that might look like two deadlifts, but roughly that three, two, one frequency. So we build that. I mean, if we're really strong or and or you're a super heavyweight, you know your work capacity sucks or and or you know you don't sleep enough and or you know you don't eat right and you have limited recovery capabilities, maybe we go a little bit lower on the frequencies. So, okay, cool, we have a number of times we, uh, we hit a lift. Then we need to find how many sets we're gonna do on each lift or how many sets we need to do to get better on each lift. And this is very individual. It's just gonna be found through trial and error. You find, hey, I feel like I'm doing nine sets, working sets of bench a week and I'm just not getting better, but I am recovering. Chances are the issue is that you need to do a bit more. Um, if you're not recovering, it needs to come down. And then we're gonna split that volume between your frequencies. So if you're a big, strong guy and or just a big guy with a bad work capacity and we're doing each lift once a week, pretty simple. We just take all those working sets that we need to do, throw them into one session. Maybe half of them can be the competition motion, half of them can be a variation, just so we're not slogging through seven sets of a single exercise in a pretty boring manner. But if maybe you select a 2x squat frequency, we split it roughly evenly between the two. Um, and we find, we find these things, right? So whether we're doing SPD day just comes down to whether we need to do SPD days to reach the desired frequency. If you're someone who just like the more often you bench, the better your bench feels and you want to work your way up to 5x bench frequency, uh, you're going to need to do multi-compound lift sessions, which is okay. So if we were the big fat guy and we're just got one squat day, one bench day, one deadlift day, the hypertrophy accessory work is pretty simple. We just do on the bench day, we hypertrophy the primary movers of the bench. On the squat day, we hypertrophy the primary, primary movers of the squat to end the session. And on the deadlift day, we hypertrophy the primary movers of the deadlift to end the session. Very simple. This can get a little bit more complicated when we're hitting like, okay, today is primary squat, secondary deadlift, but I have another squat day. When we're doing like these SPD days, we can't hypertrophy all of the primary movers for every motion. It's not gonna happen. The session would be comically long, right? So what we can do is instead, we don't have this clear delineation of when to do what hypertrophy where. We can basically just underlay a hypertrophy split under our like top, which is the, the split that we're using for our strength training. We could just do a PPL. We could do an upper and lower for the hypertrophy workouts to end the sessions. Um, and what this is where I kind of get into, if you have a lagging body part, you want to probably make sure that you have one of these micro hypertrophy workouts. So micro workouts dedicated to building up that muscle. And I usually like them to be two, no more than three motions long. And I like sharing with people the micro workouts that I have found effective. So what we're going to go through is these micro workouts to end our session. We, let's say, Roughly three quarters of our time is spent building uh, the two to three, one, two, three main compound motions. We're getting in the number of work sets. We're doing our variations that we might need to do. And then we have this 25% to end, and that's the hypertrophy uh, focused part of our session, our micro workout. Um, so I'm just gonna share with you guys micro workouts that I have found efficacious for just a couple of body parts. Uh, Cause I don't think that they're all necessarily created equal. Obviously we have to work within the constraints of, hey, if I did deadlifts, my lower back is probably pretty torched. If I'm gonna do an upper back uh, micro workout, the considerations for this micro workout is it might need to limit axial loading, right? But kind of going top up, the one that I like to give people who really have underdeveloped quads is 
basically stripped directly from uh, Tom Platt's. Tom Platt's, his old routine was quite simple. He would squat, and then he would hack squat, and then he would leg extension. So to do a micro workout following squats to emphasize the quads, I really like having people work up to one really tough set, uh, probably higher reps on the hack squat, and then do uh, basically volume on the leg extension. And if they have uh, poor knee health, their knees tend to get banged up a little bit easily, we just switch the order here. So we make sure that we do the leg extensions first, get a big pump in the quads, make sure that joint is fully warm. And by pre-exhausting the quads, the absolute loading that's gonna run through the knee joint on the hack squats is gonna be less. So let's say we're working up to a set of 15 either way. If we do the leg extensions first, we're pretty fatigued, we have to use a little bit less weight. Um, the, the hamstrings is a relatively simple one. It can look something like, depending on your fatigue, it can look like an RDL. Uh, and then a hamstring curl, so just a hip hinge and then knee flexion. It can look like a dumbbell RDL to take a little bit of weight down, really focus on a mind-muscle connection. And then a, uh, a hamstring curl, or it could be as simple as just doing back extensions and hamstring curls, right, for volume on both. Or if you have a GHD, it could be, hey, I'm gonna hit a certain number of working reps of the ham curl portion, and then I'm gonna hit a certain number of working reps of the back extension. Those are kind of the micro workouts I like throwing at people who really need to bring up their hamstrings. Uh, for glutes, I really like doing a split squat or a walking lunge. So we're training the muscle in a short or a lengthened position and then doing either a back extension or a hip thrust. So we're hitting the muscle couple sets relatively close to failure in a stretch position via the unilateral like split squat type motion. And then we hit a couple of sets in a fully contracted position via back extensions and uh, or and or hip thrusts, right? That's also something I like to look at in these is, hey, do we have one motion where we're maybe training the muscle in a fully lengthened position and one in a shortened position, right? You can see that in the quads. Uh, we're primarily focusing on the stretch position in a hack squat. We're pri primarily focusing on a shortened position in the leg extension. Uh, the hamstrings, kind of the same thing. In RDL, we're looking at a lengthened position. A hamstring curl, we're looking at a shortened position. Um, working on up for back I really like the like the kind of heavy basic compounds if someone that's their lagging body part rather than throwing like a more fluffy uh, pull down cable row uh, combo which could be absolutely effective that is an effective micro workout for the upper back but I like throwing either pull-ups and barbell rows or pull-ups and dumbbell rows uh, posting the hand on either on a bench if we need to spare the lower back and we can't do a barbell row that's one of my go-to ones for someone who needs to build up their lat development, their upper back development. Um, triceps, I really like the pairing of uh, tricep press downs and dips. I find that to be very, very effective. Uh, for biceps, I just like a curl and a neutral grip pull-up trying to go full chest to bar. I really like that pairing. Um, chest is a bit variable, but usually what I tell people is just to do some dumbbell benching and some cable pec flies, something that general effect and or uh, do some kind of press and then some kind of uh, chest focus dip where we lean forward, we get a full stretch. Chest can be pretty variable. It just depends on what the shoulders can tolerate and making sure we don't exceed the uh, work capacity of the chest, which is something that can be done in an accident. And then like a micro workout for the shoulders, more often than not, we're getting plenty of front delt work from doing our horizontal and our vertical pressing. We don't need much extra for that, but if we do, it could just be dumbbells or Smith behind the neck press for volume. And then just pairing a very simple, basic, old school workout, which is either a cable or a dumbbell lateral raise, bouncing back and forth with either a cable or a dumbbell rear delt fly. Trying to hit 100 total reps of each is one of my favorite micro workouts for the shoulders. If you kind of superset them, you can get through it relatively quickly at the end of a session, move a ton of tonnage, push a lot of blood through the delts, and drive a decent amount of growth. So this is my video. Um, I hope you guys find it helpful. And what I would like to ask you guys to do is to share any two to three motion micro hypertrophy workouts you've kind of found very effective for yourself so that other people might read the comments, say, hey, that sounds good. That's a lagging body part of mine. I'll give that a try. So please feel free to share um, what you guys have found effective. And if you found this video helpful, uh, this is your reminder to drop a like. Thank you guys.